Roxana is a self-employed lawyer in Toronto, specializing in family law and wills and estates. During her early childhood, Roxana lived in Romania. As the daughter of successful entrepreneurs, she was instilled from an early age the importance of high achievement. She spent most of her time focusing equally on being an a student and on her athleticism as a high-performance tennis player. This discipline allowed her to be a top student at the University of Toronto and earn multiple awards and scholarships. The highest recognition of her achievements Roxana is proud of is Gordon Cressy Leadership Award, one of the most prestigious student awards. Roxana likes to write articles, learn as well as teach, and consistently set professional and fitness goals. Hi Natalia, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good, trying to uh, survive very busy during uh, COVID-19 and I'm working from home today. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Um, Thank you for having me. And I have the first question. Online resources or professional services? Would you recommend to your clients, friends, family to use online sources for some items such as will templates, basic agreements, or go straight to the lawyer? Uh, I think it really depends on the type of law that people are looking to uh, get advice in. In my area, which is family and estates, I can indicate that it is a very complex area. So, um, for example, as a lawyer in family law, I use something called Divorce Me. It's a software that allows family lawyers to practice better. There's forms for court, there's agreements, all sort of provisions you can find in there, calculations. So it makes things very, very easy. So something is a tool that really helps me. However, even as a lawyer, this is one of the best tools out there for family lawyers. As a lawyer, I still need to do further research and I still need to, to think outside of just the software to be able to assist my clients. So based on that example, I think it would be very, very difficult to make something that would only by itself be sufficient for clients to use instead of legal services. Uh, what I have done uh, during COVID-19 was provide people with um, resources to make their own handwritten will. So in Ontario, you can make a will uh, by just handwriting it, and that's sufficient to meet the formalities of a will. Uh, so I made a little tutorial for people to understand how to do that. However, it is still very imperfect. It's imperfect. It's better than nothing to use these online resources but it's still imperfect. And you run the risk that people don't understand exactly what it is, even if you give them all the information in the world, clients may not actually understand the first, the basic principles, even if you give them the information. And second, they may not know how to apply it to their own situation because us lawyers ourselves do not know sometimes and we have to do further research. And the law is continuously evolving as well. So to answer your question, I think it's better to use online resources than nothing whatsoever. But just to use that, I can tell you that it's very dangerous during this time. Uh, and I do not think that the law will progress too much from that perspective. It might be a combination of some online resources paired up with legal advice by an actual person. I don't think you can take the human element from it. Mm -hmm. What challenges do you have now during COVID? Uh, during COVID, the challenges that I have, uh, I would say in terms of family law itself, is um, the inability to move forward with some of my cases because the courthouses are closed. So I have to be creative, but sometimes you need a judge to make a decision. So I think my challenges are more of the system's challenges because if you go to a courthouse you go to the clerk's office you go to file something you will see paperwork everywhere thousands and thousands of documents of paperwork instead of just the ability of, of filing everything online so because of that people also have because of the way the system is set up the people parties to a case lawyers they have to go to court in person and now during COVID-19 we are rethinking that uh, judges are starting to, to agree to do uh, video conferences and even before that they were doing some video conferences to save 
um, cost for clients and, and lawyers' time, but not often enough. It was the exception. It wasn't the rule. So I think it's more of a, of a systematic issue. I think uh, our industry, our courthouses need to change the way they do things because it's very simple. It's very, very simple to have a video conference uh, or a, a phone call or a phone conference. And we have been using that, but not that much. And right now, we cannot go to see a judge unless it's, a, it's an emergency and, and unless it abides with the rules that were set forth by the Court of Justice or Superior Court of Justice. So those are the challenges I have in terms of my practice. My personal life is a different issue, but I am saving time from not going to court. So it does help a little bit in terms of my own personal time. Oh, I see. Talking about personal time, uh, how much has your personal schedule changed? So before, as you know, uh, I have um, an infant. So my schedule before did not allow me to spend too much time with her. I was very, very busy. You can imagine I had court, then I had office meetings, then I had to have time on my own as well to draft materials and agreements. So from that perspective, my schedule right now has changed for the better. I'm still very, very busy but i have time to spend work with my daughter in the morning so instead of going to court in the morning and preparing the night before and filing all these materials and you know as i told you before all this paperwork that has to be done that's to be filed in person with the court instead of doing that now i have more time to spend with my daughter and spend a few hours in the morning with her then i also try to exercise in the morning before i used to exercise after i was done work now i do it in the morning i try to get those things those pleasure things out uh at the beginning of the day start to do work and I work as long as it takes and then everything else is also changed the evening is spent with my daughter as well but again there's there's still a lot of work so for lawyers you don't have court something else comes up people are require a different type of service so for example right now a lot of people are interested in estates so I have been developing my estate practice a lot and improving my own knowledge as well uh, and, and expertise so that took a lot of time. You would be surprised to know how much time that took and how much time it, it, it is continuing to take out of my day. So it's still quite busy, but it's very, very good to see that I can have more time to dedicate to this instead of traveling to court and doing those things. But again, it's not good for some of my clients who really need court to move forward with their matters. Pretty sure that your daughter will appreciate. <laughs> I do. Yes. Um, did you create new techniques during current times, such as new schedule or new approaches? In terms of just what I have actually implemented, they're very simple things that I have done. A lot of lawyers use their assistants to print their emails, and that's how they read their emails. So we do not, I do not believe that lawyers take full advantage of the technology, the simple technology that we have. We do not need complicated systems. We just need first to follow the basic steps. So uh, I've had to change a few things because of COVID-19, right? I've had to, uh, number one, change my retainer process. So I have now a different you know, email uh, that is sent out to new clients with requirements and things that I need from them in order to complete the retainer process. I also started because I do not have a lot of meetings now. I only have phone calls. Uh, I started to do something that I was doing with a lot of my clients before as well, which is getting all the information from the client uh, directly and getting them to do the, um, the work. So what, what I mean by that is instead of me sitting with a client in a two, three hour meeting, which is very exhausting, uh, having a short phone call with a client, guiding them to the process, and then sending them intake forms and sending them a Word document that I can then review and based on all the information they provide to me themselves in detail, then I can draft all the material for them, which makes things a lot easier. And it's simple as track changes, right? Or just um, making direct changes in a Word document or just filling out an intake form. It's not very difficult to do. So that's what I've been doing a lot with clients. And that's another reason why I save a lot of time and I'm very efficient and that saves uh, clients billable hours as well, right? They don't have to pay for that. Um, so that's good for them. And I think that uh, this whole process, we need to do this going forward as well. Um, 
for example, some of my best relationships with clients were when I had not even seen my client for a few years and we had an excellent case. We were moving forward perfectly. This is probably not a court case situation because we would have had to go to court. But let's say negotiation of agreements. Had not even seen my clients for a couple of years, but it was just very, very organized. We would have a phone call, discuss everything. They would themselves uh, come up with a response or a solution, or um, they would themselves correct uh, an agreement or respond to a letter from another lawyer. And then I would come in with my uh, strategy and my input and my research and try to perfect everything that way. So I think I'll move to, to do that a lot more. I will have less meetings, less in-person meetings and try to do, uh, to do that at least to begin with and then move to the software app. In terms of uh, client management and uh, handling and being very efficient on files, what we started to do for the first time is signing final documents online. So some of them, they're very efficient. For example, family law agreements, they are very, very efficient because you can do that online. And especially if you have a lawyer on the other side, it's really excellent. You just have a conversation with a client and uh, you can do it by way of video and you can ensure that there's no one in the room with them. They're not unduly influenced. And on top of that, as their lawyer, you have been working on the negotiation of, of the agreement for a long time. So I think that makes sense and it's very efficient for everyone. Uh, but in terms of wills, for example, the will execution and the formalities of the will, they are very different than a separation agreement. A separation agreement, you just need a witness who can be the lawyer and the lawyer has to sign the independent legal advice certificate. But the will has to be done very differently. There have, there have to be two witnesses, the witnesses have to be present at the same time, and uh, they have to sign in front of the testator. The testator has to sign in front of them. So you have to manage those people, and then there's affidavits that have to be signed as well and commissioned. So it's very complicated. So when it comes to wills, I actually found it much better to just meet in person with clients and wear masks and take all the necessary precautions to ensure that we are uh, following the guidelines with respect to the quarantine. But so it, it's very interesting how in family law, it's actually it's been very efficient in wills. It's been very, very difficult and new regulations had to had to be drafted for us to ensure that we can still do this during COVID-19. So again, it's really different, depends on the area of the law, depends on uh, the, the type of industry we're looking at in terms of how people are affected by this, uh, you know, obviously restaurant industries. They can't do anything at all. Hair salons, uh, spas, they're, they're, they're hit very hard and they have to have a very good plan in place to be able to go back into business, right? Uh, law, it's a bit different. I think we learned a bit from it. Maybe we're going to try to do things more virtually. I think the courthouses should be the ones to make the first decision to, to ensure that people always have access to justice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, let's talk about you, Roxana. What made you choose this industry? I think that it's interesting, especially for people. For example, it's very interesting for me. That's my personal question. What made mm. you go to family law? Because it's, it's very interesting what inspired you. So I think... Uh... What I usually tell students, because I have a lot of students that work with me and a lot of students that want to understand what family law is about. And some of them, they're just from the beginning, they know that they want to practice family law. I did not know that from the beginning. I have a BBA degree. I thought I would be going into law and uh, practicing tax law or business law or something like that. But I also knew that I wanted to have my own practice. So uh, when I started law school, I had no um, understanding of family law or criminal law or any of the areas of the law that I've been practicing since I started my own practice. So what happened was, and I tell this to students a lot, is I ended up having some experience in law school and criminal law. 
So I just applied for a program called CLASP and I wanted to be involved in the community and uh, have my own clients and just see what that was like. It just intrigued me. It was a program that was available and that the uh, Osgood Hall Law School was offering. So I said, why not give it a try? So eventually I interviewed and I got in and, and they gave me a job there. So as a student, I was fully in charge of my own cases. Of course, I had a supervisor who was a lawyer but I got to work in criminal law. And when you work in criminal law, you're dealing a lot with litigation, with people, and it's very, very, very different from business law. So I started to do more research and I thought that maybe this is the area to go into uh, in order to have my own business. Because in criminal law, you can open your own practice, it's no problem. In business law, it's a bit more difficult. Tax law, also a bit more difficult. So I started to have a lot of contacts in criminal law. So I articled in criminal law as well, and it was a great experience. I had a very good mentor, and he also helped me start my own practice. He had a lot, a lot of mentors, and I was very lucky to have those mentors. I wouldn't be where I am today without them. But you can't just have a mentor as a student or uh, as a beginner lawyer, as a junior lawyer. You have to have a mentor while you're practicing as well. So I ended up working at a law chamber. A law chamber means basically an office where lawyers share space. So I had my own office and other lawyers were there as well, having their own offices and we shared costs. So I met uh, other lawyers there. One of them was a family and child protection lawyer. At the time, I did not even know that child protection law existed. Uh, family law, I wasn't too aware of. Uh, I didn't know exactly what it entailed. But uh, upon having conversations with her and due to the fact that I was very new in the profession and I didn't have uh, many, many clients and I wasn't so busy as to not learn something new, uh, she took me on and she showed me a few things and I actually became very interested in family law because, uh, particularly because of my business degree, which I never thought that it would help, but it did because family law and what makes me very passionate about it, uh, are the agreements and the court orders, the strategy, uh, and the property, the support, the financial issues as well. And the strategy, uh, the strategy can be with respect to children, with custody and access, can be with respect to a lot of things. So um, you know how they say usually when you go to an interview, you have to show them that you have transferable skills. So I feel like in real life, those BBA skills and what I learned from there, uh, which was a lot, uh, a lot of different uh, skills with respect to strategy, marketing, uh, finances, how to handle a, a business, uh, the experience that I got as a volunteer, I used to do taxes for people, a research assistant, all these things, they really shaped me up as a professional and as the well-rounded family lawyer. Because I think that a lot of family lawyers don't understand that it's not just fighting, it's not just uh, being a zealous advocate, it's about having a deep understanding of the strategy and the law and the property issues and, and financial issues, those are very important as well. And a lot of lawyers, family lawyers are not comfortable with those issues, which I am comfortable with. And I just realized I really, really was enjoying it. I really was enjoying family law. And I started to move away from criminal law, which I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do. It was interesting. It's good that I got the experience. And again, going back to those transferable skills, criminal law, gave me the litigation experience to be comfortable in court and family law as well. So it was all very, very good. It was all a very positive experience at the beginning. It was very difficult to decide what I wanted to do. Uh, obviously, as someone interested in property and finances, I, always, I also took an interest in the states and was in the states. So that one is a practice that I've been, I have been developing for quite some time. And during the quarantine, I actually got the chance to work on some very, very interesting cases. So I think at this point in my career, I find that family law and wills really fulfills me. And it's what I want to do. It's what I'm good at. And it's what I want to be good at. It really drives me to do research in the area. Every time I write a blog post or something like that, it really makes me excited. And um, it's very emotional as well. It's not something that a lot of people can handle, 
But I think as you uh, become more senior in the area, I think you, you understand how to approach it from a strategic point of view and how to manage the clients better to make it less emotional for everyone involved. Thank you. You sound very passionate and inspired about your job. I, it's amazing. I really am. And it's very nice when you reach that point in your career where you realize what you like to do and that you do what you like. It's very, it's very nice and it's, it's important, but it takes some time because at the beginning, I wasn't very comfortable with family law and actually had thought that I would not end up working in family law, particularly because there's a lot of criminal lawyers. They came to me and they said, how can you do family law? Family law is so emotional. Criminal law, you know, everyone gets along. Uh, prom prosecutors get along with criminal lawyers most times. Uh, and then family lawyers, you see them fighting in court, right? Uh, but it's not the way I practice. Um, it's I'm aggressive, but to a certain point, I'm also professional. I don't take things personally, and I don't think it's good for the client if the lawyer takes things personally. I see. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have one, a uh, couple of more questions. Um, I feel that family law requires a lot of physical and emotional contribution, as you've mentioned. How do you manage it? Is it rewarding? It's, it is very rewarding. So I'll tell you right now, uh, maybe 50% of my cases start off very strong. Uh, that first letter from the opposing counsel can be uh, very difficult for the clients to accept because the emotions are very high. And some clients come to me and they say, I want to settle and I want to be done uh, yesterday. And I tell them, no, that I do not think in your situation that's possible. I think most of the times it takes about two years for people to, to reach an agreement and to move on. Uh, but uh, again, it's just the realization that it will be like that in the beginning. And I can tell you, I've had many cases where the situation was very, very bad in the beginning. And then at the end, uh, the clients were not even happy to finish anymore because uh, if they had been in the beginning again, at the beginning point, they would have been very happy. But because the process is so long, they didn't even know how to react when it was over. So you just have to understand the process, the psychology of it a little bit, when there's a lot of animosity between the parties and there's children involved and there's all sorts of different personalities. You just have to take it how it is, but uh, you are still a professional and you can't speak a certain way to the opposing party or to your client. You have to be clear with your client. You can't give them false hope uh, because that's just going to be to more uh, headache down the road for them. And uh, you have to be honest with your clients. I think that's the most important part. You just have to be as in any situation, stay strong and you are the one the client relies on so you just have to be strategic you have to use your experience uh, to help the client and if you cannot help them you have to tell them that and that's the end of the story thank you who is the person or persons that inspire you uh, so that's a good i like the way you phrase that question who is the person or persons because I cannot say I have one person who inspires me. Uh, first, I would say my mom uh, is very inspirational. She's the one that uh, has that business mind. She is a very good person to talk to when it comes to business. Uh, and she's always uh, pushed me and uh, motivated me to do better and to start my own business. Now, uh, again, it's not just my mom. I look up to a lot of people, a lot of successful professionals. Uh, I look up to a lot of my mentors and they inspire me and I learn from them. Uh, I usually look up to people that make no excuses, people that were at their worst and they keep going. Uh, one of them would be probably Lewis House. He's all over social media. He's a, a great influencer. I, I like his podcast, The School of Greatness, where he brings up a lot of professionals, a lot of athletes, a lot of successful business people that started from nothing or they had a lot, but they made it even bigger. And uh, all of these people are very inspirational. And I think just anyone who ob obtains success, who achieves success in life, uh, should be looked at and something can be learned from them. 
Uh, other people I look up to are uh, friends, are uh, not just people that succeeded in terms of business, but people that have a great outlook on life. So I take, I try to take those qualities from people, uh, people that are positive, people that maintain positivity when they should not, um, even even great grandparents or, or grandparents that are not even in this country, they do not even know what entrepreneurship is, but they just have a, a good outlook on life. Uh, I try to take everything from all these people and those are the people that influence me. Thank you. And the last question, three words, please, that can be associated with successful people. Uh, three words. Okay. First word would be consistency. They are consistent. Consistent in achieving their goals and working towards achieving their goals. You can't just uh, have a goal and then work on it one day, but then you stop working on it. Or you can't uh, say that you want to write a book but then you work a couple of weeks and then, no, it's too hard. I will never be an author. So it's consistency in the sense of, you know, you don't make excuses. You keep going forward uh, until you reach that goal. I would say innovative is also very important. Okay. You can't just sit back and expect the clients as a lawyer to come to you. So a lot of people say, uh, and I've seen a lot of um, senior lawyers, they don't, they do not have a website. It works for them. It really does work for them and their clients and their referral bases. But you have to do a lot. You have to see where you're at and you have to be innovative with your practice and with uh, providing people with services. So innovation, I think, is very, very important. And I would also stay resourceful. It's very, very important to find the resources to achieve what you want to do. So in my case, I have to ensure that uh, resources, I mean, for law, they come from everywhere. They come from client referrals to um, research. So I have a really good way of researching. Um, I have a lot of documents, a lot of state research that I've memos, and I always take advantage of everything that I can get to improve my practice. Even if a student volunteers with me or a student works for me, I always ensure I give them a lot of research projects or uh, they do something that improves my practice, but also teaches them, right? So um, that's another part of being resourceful is ensuring that, you know, you don't just take, take, take from people or from others, right? You also give back, right? So, right? Or if you have a mentor or if you give a referral to someone else, right? They sh you should give them something in return as well. You can't just take from people. You have to, 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 to give them something as well. So I would say those three being consistent, innovative, and resourceful. That's my answer. I think there will be a lot more, but right now, today, uh, that's what I think is most important. Thank you very much for your great uh, knowledge, for your amazing fresh look uh, to your industry. And I um, hope we'll have another interview. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to learning from you because I know that you have a lot of processes that could help a business such as mine. So I look forward to uh, tuning into your channel and learning from what you're doing right now. Thank you.